being at this conference, speaking to so many of the great projects, I mean, I feel some of the best projects that I've seen that have done well are usually those that don't truly advertise the fact that they utilize blockchain. It's typically an obscured process to the end consumer. Emerging economies, credible crisis, and cryptocurrency. Blockchain's value proposition becomes even more pertinent when seen in light of emerging economies. The question is, will it solve today's credibility crisis? Moderated by Anna Pelova. Your influence. Jürgen Hobarth. Tokenization Limited. Jared Wynn. Win Solutions. Dana Faruja, Tech.mt. Monty Mumford, Orbs. Hi, everyone. So before we start, I just want to give a quick introduction of myself. My name is Anna Pelova. I am a content creator, and I run my own content marketing agency. And I also have a book project where I travel around the world to interview entrepreneurs from both developed and emerging markets. So today I have four amazing panelists, and hopefully this will be a very insightful conversation. Uh, but before we begin, I just want to give you a quick icebreaker to ponder on. So when you say emerging economies, most people imagine unstable government, hyperinflation, poor education, lack of access to banking services, and so on. But then you also have countries like Bulgaria, where I'm coming from, for example, which is in the EU and has entirely different problems. And it's so different from countries in South Africa, in Africa and South America. So when you say emerging economies, what do you imagine? What is your definition of the term? Okay, for me, basically, I think the term is I live now since 11 years in Asia, and I see there are markets developing like Indonesia, Malaysia. So this is for me like of emerging markets. Okay, Jared? I, I would also resonate with that sentiment. Emerging economies, definitely in the Asia markets, the up-and-coming markets, the, the growth areas, those sectors that are ultimately still developing, but at the same time growing, where blockchain can also be a complement to that growth. Mm -hmm. And what, what, what are the biggest issues that you see there in these countries? Uh, a lot of the issues that I see is, uh, for one, just trust in systems. Uh, there's many countries that right now officials don't even believe the numbers that are being reported. And obviously, blockchain being a trust-based system, um, there's a lot of synergies that could be placed with blockchain. But that said, I would say trust is the one thing that all governments would be wanting to achieve and one thing that blockchain could facilitate. Dana? Well, to me, um, uh, emerging economies are all driven by peer demand, peer-to-peer -peer mass demand in reality, and it's not, it's not country-based or, or the natural evolution that we most of the time discuss. It's all driven by the consumer, I mean, and uh, you, you truly see the power of the consumer when you see economies, new economies developing, and, uh, and as Jared said, um, uh, in this uh, disruptive, environment that we are living in, uh, the major thing that you have to um, uh, handle all the time is trust. Trust, OK. Monty? Oh, I just like the fact that it's a new phrase, emerging you know, uh, economy. It used to be underdeveloped economy or less developed economy. And I think emerging economies puts a nicer spin on it, as it's something good that's happening. Um, so I think all of the you know, the ones that were just described. But I suppose for me it would be Africa. That's where I see the most awesomeness. Okay. Um, and there are a lot of projects that talk about how they're going to solve certain problems. Um, but can you share some real life examples of projects that have already done that or are doing this successfully? And why do you believe they will survive these markets? Okay, I can give you an idea. So, like, uh, we have in Hong Kong a very unique situation. And there are a lot of uh, people from the Philippines working. Mm -hmm. And before, they had the problem, OK, if you want to remittance money from Hong Kong back to your family, and imagine they own around 300 US dollars, but the transaction fee would be like 20 to 30 US dollars, which is 10% of the amount they send. There's like a couple of companies which already do this. They are traditional fintech companies. But what they learned, they maybe just cut the fee a little bit. But now there are already projects starting to work on to this purely on cryptocurrencies and stablecoins. 
share it? Um, being at this conference, speaking to so many of the great projects, I mean, I feel some of the best projects that I've seen that have done well are usually those that don't truly advertise the fact that they utilize blockchain. It's typically an obscured process to the end consumer, but um, other projects I was just speaking to, I think it's Aerobank, they were talking about how the archaic processes of ticketing when it comes to flights and all of the middlemen that are involved in that, you know, there's obvious use cases that can drive success. And when it comes to having those solutions, Ultimately, it's going to be driving away some of the middlemen, which are going to have opposition to that change. But nonetheless, uh, it's those use cases that are a no-brainer that should obviously be taking place. And this resistance to change is the only thing that's going to be preventing it. Mm -hmm. Well, in Malta, in the past year, I have seen uh, many projects um, uh, starting to, to take, take form uh, um, on these new technologies. Um, uh, the common factor with all these, these projects is that um, companies, technology companies, are uh, grabbing parts of processes um, uh, wherever in the, in the value chain and uh, remodeling them, putting them on open source and uh, increasing scalability at a global level. And that is giving a lot of power both to the consumer and also to the, to the bottom line of, of these companies. Okay, I would say um, blockchain for good. Um, I think uh, the sourcing of ethnic materials or ethnic, you know, the ethnic sourcing of minerals. I think uh, Ford Motor Company are doing stuff with IBM and DRC for, you know, to check that um, uh, lithium is sourced properly, is not used with child labor. The blockchain's working very well for that. Um, and also, I think maybe the charity model, especially in Africa, I mean, that's probably, I know a little bit more about that than most places. Um, but the charity and the aid model seems to be completely fucked and broken and ridiculous in the wastage that happens there. If blockchain, which I think there are a number of projects that are beginning to kind of approach that matter, excuse my language, by the way, but it really annoys me. Um, uh, so you can see where money goes at every point and it's used efficiently and properly and not in a patronizing way that they're emerging economies and they need our help. Mm -hmm. We don't need, they don't need our help. They just want to work together with us. That's, that's what I hope blockchain might do. And when you talk about governments and trust that you all mentioned is, a, is an issue, there are two kinds of people. People who believe that crypto and blockchain is the solution, we should create a new alternative, um, we shouldn't have centralized authorities. But then there are also projects that want to help governments, and there are also like real applications that have worked successfully. And maybe, Dana, you can give us more uh, insight because you work with the government. But uh, which do you believe is the right approach? Should we create an alternative? or should we help governments and uh, work with them? <laughs> Dana, do you want to start? Um, um, in my opinion, when you have an idea and you go to a country and you try to implement that idea in a country, if you do not have the support of the ecosystem, of the government system of that country, obviously your company will face many more problems. Um, obviously, when you have the government uh, being in a stable position and uh, adopting itself new technologies, being part of emerging technologies, um, walking hand in hand with uh, evolution in different economic sectors, then this makes your life much easier. Yeah, because you can't really ignore the government. It's going to be there. <laughs> they go hand in hand. You cannot have the private sector working on its own or the government working on its own. We have seen this model um, reaping a lot of benefits here in Malta. Um, uh, they both coexist. You cannot survive on your own. The government does not survive on its own and the private sector does not survive on its own. They have to merge and work together. Can you share a few examples from your work? Uh, that you um, uh, I think uh, this is one of the factors that has uh, reaped the economic success that we are uh, uh, um, experiencing at the moment as a country. Um, the fact that the government has worked hand in hand on many private projects with the private sector has helped to grow our economy to what it is today. And the same is happening in the technology sector now. The government in the past two years has been very supportive, has been very adoptive. Um, we started with the edu education system. We are continuing with health. 
We are now working on the company registration processes uh, to migrate them onto blockchain. So uh, we also uh, try to keep abreast with, uh, with new technologies by keeping in close contact with the private sector. It's an open door policy. Everyone is welcome. This government listens. So that all this mix helps to produce um, uh, what we are seeing today. Okay, and Monty, I know you've traveled a lot. We just had a quick chat. So what is your opinion about that? Um, I think that there's, uh, we got rid of apartheid in South Africa, right? 25 years ago, or whatever. But I think there's a, there's a massive disparity and a kind of almost fascism and apartheid when it comes to currencies. So you have, you know, the currencies that you know, fiat, dollar, euro, pound, whatever. We can go anywhere if you're from those countries, right? Anywhere you like, you know what I mean? And it's really cheap wherever you go. And then if you look at, let's say, the bottom 50 currencies, if you're in DRC or Zimbabwe in billions of dollars, right? This is a completely screwed up situation. So maybe focus, instead of going straight to, I don't know, kind of all newfangled ideas, if you could have a stable coin for the kind of 50 worst performing currencies in the world, and then you know, make that gap less. If you're from Tanzania or DRC, you're never going to be able to go to New York. You're never going to be able to go to London or even Sofia. You, you know what I mean? Because you just, it, and it's completely, it really makes two worlds. If you could bring those 50 currencies up to the top 50 currencies, using a stable coin or using crypto or something like that would be amazing. And probably a much more kind of, you know, pragmatic approach than, you know, blockchain of the future, blah, blah, blah. Okay. Jared, Jürgen, do you want to share your opinion? You know, I, I, I will actually just say as well that if there is going to be an impact, it's almost a, just with any approach, even from a sales approach, when you're trying to drive sales revenues, you focus on your bottom and you focus on your top and the middle in between usually doesn't get the most focus. Um, reasoning behind that is, is you can make the biggest impact on those that have the greatest ability of change. So Zimbabwe, India, those countries, um, I think that those would obviously be the countries that would be more open to a solution. Uh, but that said, even working with uh, governments and IoT and things of those nature, um, there was always a high burden of proof that was necessary as to why they would even want to consider a technology, um, let alone then overcoming the hurdles of blockchain. And even mentioning blockchain obviously caused uh, quite a bit of hesitation when uh, disseminating the product information to them. Uh, but beyond that, it, that's the media that we are up against. Uh, and that's uh, where there's opportunity, there's always going to be corruption. Mm -hmm. So w given that there's such a strong opportunity with blockchain, I think it's just really key about the messaging and the way that that messaging is provided uh, to those governments. So. Yeah, and it's also a good point that many of these governments are actually open, although we, preserve, we perceive them as a stable. But for example, Somaliland, where people are recreating their country, this can have a real good application. And yeah, Jürgen? Yeah, this is what I wanted to say as well. So yeah, definitely there are governments open for change. But uh, what I experienced uh, with traditional fintech it just is a different pace. So you can assume, like, if you think in South Africa, there was once a problem uh, that people got mucked. Mm -hmm. And then was coming out a mobile app where you could pay with the QR codes, like it's in China in WeChat. And adoption happened on the private sector. So because the government didn't address that problem. And I think in other countries, if you work with the government, as my personal experience, to get things done, it takes like three, four times. So sometimes the private sector outperforms. Mm. And we see it now as well. So you know, in China somehow, they want to do now their own stable coin. Let's see how that works out. And then you have the same story in uh, the US, where Libra is coming. So in Libra, it's coming from the private sector, whereas in China, it's coming from the government sector. That's a very good point, actually. Yes, yes. Um, and when it comes to the private sector, many people in the audience are actually business oriented. So I guess the million dollar or the 111 Bitcoin question is how can you um, work in these markets and deliver solutions that actually become successful? Uh, because these markets give you a great opportunity to leapfrog and apply yeah. a technology, uh, jump straight to the solution. I can give you a good example. So, for example, if you want to do a mobile payment solution in uh, Vietnam, uh, you would not be able to do it because the government is there too strong and they control the market. So from the private sector, if you go into this market, it's undoable. If you try to do something like, uh, as you said, like Bulgaria or, for example, 
I think there is a regulation where it would be able to do it. We have money transfer license, and you can do things very easily, convenient. You don't need the government. And uh, if you think further, in some other countries, it, it's a mixture, to be honest. It's always like each market is completely unique. And you know, if in Europe you want to sell securities on the blockchain, you need to apply the securities law. There is no way around it, because there's already a regulation. So you need, as a private person or in the private sector, needs to apply to certain rules, to be honest. Mm -hmm. So, Jared, how would you deliver the message if you're an entrepreneur? <laughs> so, uh, really, I, I, it would be that exactly. It's a matter of your product is only going to ever be as good as your messaging. And I've seen countless keynotes with regards to products that were just an amazing product, but they didn't know their audience very well. And the, the high-level information that they were providing just really wasn't giving the value that the audience needed to hear. So, uh, in short, I would really say is, is with your product, ensure that the messaging is proper, that you have several channels of that message one that's a, a simple one that is going to go to probably 99.9% .9 of the audience, uh, the other one that is more technical for those that like to go into that depth. But it, truly, in, in order for people to trust what it is that you're saying, they have to understand it. And I urge people to really take caution when advertising their product to make sure that it is interpretable by all audiences. But is it different when you create your message? Is it different for the developed markets and for the emerging markets, or you use the same strategy? You know, I would say that the, the strategy would be similar in terms of approach, but when it comes to developing market, it would be very much this is the bottom line, this is what could be improved. You know, you aren't trying to do a sales pitch in order to drive your revenue. Whatever it is that you're providing is ultimately going to improve them, and they need to see those figures. So it's going to be very mathematically driven, I feel, in that type of environment. Okay, so we have a few minutes. Uh, Dana and Monty, if you can add your insight. I can't add anything to that at all. No. <laughs> Absolutely brilliant. Both of them. OK, thank, thank you. you. Dana? Well, um, uh, from my end, what I would like to ask, uh, add is that um, in reality, in this, uh, in this new emerging technology, with, we're dealing with managing risk all the time, wherever we are. If we're dealing with crypto, we're dealing with blockchain, we're dealing with, with adoption of these new technology, is managing risk. And everyone sometimes expect that um, governments, that companies do not make mistakes. And credibility crisis is all about managing risk in reality. So I think we have to be participative, but also we have to be understanding that people need to take decisions in such volatile markets. And we need to understand that mistakes in this process will be done. And uh, governments, companies need, to, need time to, to adjust, to, to recalibrate and move into the right direction. OK, thank you, everyone. So our time is almost up. So thank you, Jurgen, Jared, Dana, and Monty. Thank you.